box. Box. You already know what's in the box, but what you don't know is that this monument to untapped potential has been in my way for over a year now. It's time to free the creature from its crate and see if we can get some picking and placing done. Hello, I'm Pat Deegan, president of Psychogenic Technologies, and as you've guessed, this box contains a low-cost, high-accuracy, charm-high CHM T36VA desktop SMT pick-and-place machine. Eh. Eh. Better. Now, it may be low cost, but this machine has a proven track record and should just work. But I, as usual, am not going down the well-trodden path. No, I, of course, am going to make my life a little bit more difficult because I insist on using it with OpenPNP. I have no idea how that's going to work out. I've had many adventures using my trusty light placer. That pick and place is reliable, lots of fun, and has handled all my needs for dozens of layouts and hundreds of boards. It was the perfect introduction to automated assembly, and one of the reasons I chose it was how open it was. I assembled the thing myself and knew every single bolt and connection intimately. An open design and being able to get in there and fix things is what I'm all about. This Charm High machine isn't so open, but it looks well built and maybe even fast, and fast is what I need now, so worth a try. But out of principle, and also because I'm rather particular about which software I'll install, even on some dusty Windows machine I'll never use for anything else, I'm just not using random code from China. China, 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 China. I want software I trust and works well, that's open source and that I can customize. And all that perfectly describes the muy awesome OpenPNP. Now I've been sitting on this thing for 13 months now. One upside of that is owing to recent decisions, we've currently got an inflation infatuation. So it looks like I saved a buck or two, hooray. More importantly, a quick scan of the internet seems to show that some trailblazers have been blazing trails, and if I'm lucky, it will be more promenade than blaze for me. So if things go well, this will be a complete but quick guide to getting the T36VA working with OpenPNP. If they go not so well, let this be a lesson to all you warranty voiders out there. Nah, I'll try and figure it out and see how far we get. The first thing to do is get it out of that box and see if they ship me 120 pounds of fidget spinners or a pick and place machine. Then get it installed somewhere, power it up, take a peek at its guts, and finally get down to the business at hand. The smart thing to do would be to test it first using the manufacturer's software. Nah, not gonna do it. I'm out of warranty anyway, and making machines work is what we do, right? So let's do it. Right. Oh. <laughs> Not fidget spinners. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh. Check it out. Yeah, let's get this out of there. Oof. Let's go. Ouch. Well, that was something. <gasps> Boy, that's a heavy monster. Got it up there. First power up. Does it home? Does it do anything? Does nothing. Doesn't explode either. After getting it up on the table, I tried to get a look inside. Damn, something was pulling, and I missed uh, that one. Oh. All right, let's take a peek inside if this thing. Oh, damn. Okay. Uh, pretty cool. Power supplies, at least one of them's a mean well. Uh, these things with the giant heat sinks must be motor drivers. Uh, pumps, I guess this is vacuum. That must be blower, the tiny one over here. Oh, and the, uh, the motherboard here. It's got the MCU here, which says something like Vol. 927. Not sure what that means, but I'm going to get rid of that sticker to make sure that uh, we've got the MCU we're expecting. SWDIO, whatever the programmer thing seems to be there. Oh, and when you're putting it down, be mindful of the camera here and these wires because oof, this thing is heavy and will crush it. All right, we've had a little look inside and it's pretty cool. I have it propped up with a book here, which is less than ideal. Uh, this whole thing of lifting it up would be okay if you have to go and play with the pumps or something like that. But uh, this nice finish here is beautiful, but just isn't user serviceable. I think I'm going to go and do some uh, destructive removal. Mm. 
Hmm. Ooh. Nice. I want to get this label off to see what we actually have here and make sure I don't try to program something I don't have. And there we go. Definitely. Nice little ST and arm. The program interface is right there. Where's the UART though? So I've got it uh, securely propped up here. That's totally safe. And uh, I'm going to plug it back in, turn it on, and check some voltages. Uh, I'd like to know if the programmer interface is really a 3v3. Uh, there's a UART there that seems to be free. So I'm going to check that too. Then we'll start uh, hooking up programmers and stuff. Power this thing up. Oh, some light. Some action. I've got a convenient ground thing here plugged in. So VCC on the uh, UART is five volts. We can guess what TX and RX are. Programmer starting on the left. Number one reads as 3.29. Okay. Number two, groundish, maybe floating. Number three, oh, that's very groundish. And number four is 3v3. Okay, so hopefully this will match what we expect. Yes, the debug programmer header is in fact VDD on the right, ground, serial debug clock, and finally IO. So there are a few versions, forks of forks, of smoothieware for charm high pick and place machines. I got a version from Jan M012012, built it and got set up with an ST link and a little adapter board that allows me to not look up which pin is what on the programmer. Then I went to use my usual command line tools to burn the firmware and things got a little tricky. Okay, it's the moment of truth. I've got the ST link programmer there connected. I've got my little command line ready. ST flash format, IHEX, blah, blah, blah. Let's try this. Eeks. Well, that didn't work at all. Right protected. I think I need to erase this guy. Um, ST flash, erase. Let's give it a shot. It's right protected. Well, that's nice. I want to force it, fucker. All right. So, uh, being impatient. Hmm. Not so. Not so great. Hmm. So it's right protected. Hmm. Super. Thanks, Charm High. So I kind of got impatient. How do I erase this? How do I force the unlock? And now I'm in this beautiful situation. Ah! Oh no! That can't be good. So, I don't know. We'll see what we can do. Yeah, I tried some voodoo commands I didn't understand. I got off the internet somewhere and it wound up in a bad state. So I relented and installed the heavy STM cube thing. Even with that, the process was super messy, probably because of my screw up. Programming would work, but not get verified. Then it would work, but wind up in some weird loop that did not sound good at all, spitting out garbage through the UART. That was exciting. So I think it's fixed. Uh, I managed to burn some firmware. Now when you turn it on, a couple of sounds, but nothing crazy. There is a chance I burned some motors. Uh, the pumps, I'm actually really worried about the pin to pull the feeds. If that was locked on for uh, too long, it'll just burn out and I have to replace it. So anyways, uh, we're gonna start by checking that the firmware runs. Uh, eventually I'll be able to check all the bits that I may have exploded. Though it was no longer going crazy on power up, it was acting a tad mm, funny. Is this what it should be doing? I don't know, man. On top of the junk that it's spitting out, that looks a lot like a reset loop. Okay, check it out. It does seem to have been the watchdog. Keep an eye on this screen as I power up. Ah, stuff appears but it doesn't keep on scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. It's not resetting all the time. So it's garbage, but it's garbage that is actually behaving okay. This is uh, the emergency stop. Ah, more stuff appears. Okay, so things are actually happening. That's good. So with the system that's behaving, it was time to figure out why I was getting garbage on the serial terminal. I checked my wiring, tried different baud rates. Yeah, it should work. So I needed to see what was actually going on and brought a scope over to the machine. Wow, okay, check it out. Look, this is a capture of that initial splurt of a data from the beginning. It's just a bunch of crap. It's being decoded as a bunch of crap. But if I change the order to LSB, megahertz, booyah. So actual words are coming out. <sighs> okay. I really cannot say that I understand what's going on exactly, but uh, I think uh, the machine is doing what it's supposed to be doing, i.e. sending the RS-232 stuff 
LSB first. Somehow my host or somewhere down the line, it's being interpreted the other way around and that's just causing a big mess. The smoothie stuff is running on the machine and it's doing what it's supposed to do. So if we can only get to talk to it, everything will be fine. Oh, so wrong. Took me a while longer to see it, but look here, polarity. That's not right, or at least not usual. Everything was normal except that polarity. See it sitting low and then going high on activity? Yeah. So the bits are being sent okay, but the polarity is flipped. Okay, progress was made, but I'm hoping to seal the deal starting fresh today. So far, <laughs> So far, we've learned what's inside the box that was in the box and how to get access to the programming and UART we need. That the firmware is right protected? Come on, peeps. Keep your blasted firmware secret if you must, but let overwriting it not be a pain. I already voided the warranty just by getting access to the pins. Anyway, the most important lesson on that front is use the STMQ programmer thing and disable write protection by checking all the checkboxes, and then you can burn the smoothie port. Also, double check that the watchdog is set to software or it'll reset continuously. I was jolted by the PNP turning apparently everything on and getting stuck there. I'm guessing the vacuum blower pumps are okay, but may have burned out the solenoid for the drag pin. Hopefully we'll discover the extent of the damage soon because the last thing we learned was that the UART seems funny. I was getting a bunch of garbage on the serial line and checked everything from my baud rate and wiring to the HSE clock settings deep in the embed code. But somehow it looks like the polarity is inverted at least for the TX side from the MCU. <laughs> okay, check this out. This here is just a basic breadboard inverter using a MOSFET and keep an eye on that screen there as I turn it on. What's this? Wowzas, actual decent output, awesome. Okay, we're all set. It turns out that the RX and TX are both inverted, so I doubled up my little circuit here and cleaned up the breadboard, and now we have comms. Now, with hindsight from the mysterious future here, I'm starting to think that maybe, just maybe, I should have had a peek inside the user manual before I started. Or at least check what was in this silver box, which, even if it has a weird DB9 connector, looks a lot like a way to talk to the machine. I worked around the issue my own way, so still haven't bothered to actually draw that thing. Meh. Back to playing with the machine. Turn it on. Okay. Oh, you see the alarm kill just went off here. Nice. But you can reset that with M999. Let's try a couple of actual G code commands. G28.6, easy to remember, is basically the current position and it comes out just fine. Okay, let's try the vacuum pump. Oh, okay. Let's do some LEDs. M814. Oh, 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 815 to turn off. That's beautiful. Let's try something a little scarier. Enable the steppers. Everything is locked into place. This is wonderful. M18. And now they're free again. Okay, we can talk to it, we can talk to it. Now I'm going to try and set up a very small move. Smoothie and my hacked up cereal looked like it was all working okay, but I was still a little nervous about actually controlling the steppers and moving the machine around until I realized the stepper motor isn't even installed. Mm-hmm. We can move Y as much as we want with no ill effects. <laughs> That's pretty cool. 1,000. Look at that. Isn't that sweet? Now, I think I'm going to actually risk a little X move. G1, X10. Ha! X40. Ha ha ha. Okay. This is great. Oh, that is abrupt. All right. I guess I need to finish putting this together. I'd never really peeked inside the second box of stuff, which I probably should have. That's the mysterious gray box that probably could have saved me a ton of trouble. Juki, juki, juki. Oh. <laughs> Look at that. That's a solenoid with a drag pin. So they included an extra. Why, thank you, Charm Height. That was considerate. So after bolting on the Y stepper, no, not that way. Yes, that's better. Then I got the support for the reels on. Not easy as there's a bunch of stuff in the way all the time. <laughs> so annoying. Finally, I could get the belt to activate the peeler on. Um, derp. Oh, no. 
<laughs> Idiot. That was pretty dumb. So yes, put the belt in place before all the bolts. Ah! It's a yeah. Okay. Undo it all, and then a round of re-bolting. Re-bolting. After getting everything locked down, I wrote a couple of little G-code scripts I could shoot over the serial and... I do believe this works. <laughs> so the machine itself is working well and we can talk to it over serial. No reason open PNP should be a problem at this point. That cheap IKEA tabletop, however, might be okay for testing, but I actually got worried it would tip over with all that wobble. Check this out. <laughs> when it came time to launch OpenPNP, I found that some of those trailblazers had been nice enough to provide samples of their config online. But when I tried them... Now, this is actually all my fault. I've been accused of running and showing off pretty old versions of OpenPNP. Rightfully so, it's true. I use this stuff for work, and there are large periods where a stable working installation is worth a lot more than running the latest and greatest. I hope Mark doesn't hate me too much for it. I promise I'll be more up to date when I show stuff off from now on. In this case, I should have updated before trying those CAN machine XML. I did upgrade, but I decided to start fresh while using those examples as inspiration instead, so I could really get to know the inner workings of the dual head cam system, the switcher camera, the drag pin, all that. After a bit of futzing, I got a basic setup working. All right, have a look at this. Click. Mmm, the douchial goodness. I can now see every component. This is looking a lot like a pick and place machine. <laughs> oh, and I didn't need that extra drag pin after all. Here are my initial tests of the pin and feeder. And of the heads. Oof, <laughs> that wobble though. Really need to do something about that. So the machine works well with OpenPNP. There are some things I have already and want to improve further. The lighting kind of sucks, that big hole in the front isn't ideal, the cam switching is a bit slow, the drag reel feeders are cool, but the loose part thing is so-so. I'll get into all that, but I think I'll put these sub-projects out as separate videos focused on a single aspect, so you can just watch the bits you're most interested in. I'll be releasing config info, schematics, and more along with each of those, so keep an eye open if you're curious. I hope this journey slash comedy of errors was entertaining and informative and might inspire you to take the plunge if you want an open PNP pick and place that you don't have to assemble yourself. Let me know if you're thinking about it or if you already use an off the shelf machine with open PNP, how that's working out. Or if there's anything I haven't covered that you're curious about, let me know. Thanks for watching. Happy making. Cheers.